I am supposed to be speaking on finite abelian groups, their structure. So the first thing to realize is that abelian groups are precisely what are called uh, Z modules. Okay, so what is Z here? Z is the ring of integers. And I guess all of us know what a module means. Uh, so let us uh, mm, look at it. It's, uh, it's an abelian group. So I'm defining, <laughs> in a sense, this is uh, a circuitous definition. But what, what uh, I want to say here is that, you know, j just look at Z as a ring and um, the concept of a Z module is the same as that of as an abelian group. Okay, so the circuitousness comes from the following. Z module, by, when I say Z module, I, I mean uh, an abelian group to begin with. And so if you have a ring A, let's say a commutative ring A with identity, um, of which Z is an example, then we can talk about an A module, M, right? So let's say by A module, I mean left A module. It's a commutative ring. So right A modules and left A modules are uh, the same. So let's just talk about left A modules. Uh, that's our convention. It's a convention. So what is such, a th such an object? It is an abelian group to M is an abelian group to begin with. And it has uh, a scalar multiplication by elements of A. Uh, A cross M to M to M. There's a map which we write A comma M to A M. Right? And this has certain axioms, the usual axioms, distribution over M, distribution over A. What I mean by that is, what I mean by that is A plus A prime into M is A M plus A prime M and A M plus M prime is A M plus A M prime and one times M is M and such such things. So I assume everybody knows what an A module M is. So uh, as a Z module is, is an object when I take this A to be Z. Okay, and so an abelian group is nothing more than a Z module. Essentially, what we are saying is that if I take an abelian group, the Z module structure comes for free. So we have to dis define what it means for, let's say, given M in, uh, so given an abelian group. Uh, so what should I uh, use for an abelian group? Let me use the letter M, okay? Uh, given an abelian group M, M, I want to know what N times, uh, and M is an element of M, and N is in Z, I would like to know what N times M is. What does this mean, okay? This is M plus M plus M, N times, Okay, I'll give, I need to give myself more space here. So let me do that. And move this down. So I can give myself more space here. M plus M, N times, if N is, this makes sense if, uh, if uh, N is positive, right? Or even zero, if it's zero, just zero times, it's an empty sum, and that's by convention equal to zero. And if uh, it is uh, negative, if n is less than zero, then nm is equal to uh, minus m plus minus m. These the modulus of n times. So modulus of n is a positive integer. And so these many times where 
minus m is the as the obvious meaning is such that m plus minus m is zero so it's the additive inverse of m okay uh, so so with this it's easy to check that these whatever axioms for a z module are satisfied and so if you have an abelian group the z module structure on it comes for free so abelian groups are nothing but uh, just uh, z modules i hope this is clear okay uh, we want to talk about finite abelian groups so the, where the abelian group uh, the underlying its set is finite but before we do that, let's talk about uh, a finitely generated module, okay, over a commutative ring. Say, suppose we have that. So, what's a finitely generated module? If you have a set, if you have a module M, right, over a ring, I used uh, A here. Maybe I should have used R. Okay, uh, let's say oh, A module M. When do we say that M is finitely generated? Well, that that is so, so a module is finitely generated, shortened to FG, if there exists M1, M2, Mn, finitely many elements of M, many elements of M, such that um, any element of M, so if I take A times M1 plus dot 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 A times Mn, this is equal to M. So what this means is, um, let's add a page here. So, so this M, so what this means is the essential part is this given any m in m we there exists we can or we can choose a1 through a n in a such that this m is a1 m1 plus a2 m2 etc until a n m n so, the, give, so these are fixed, m1 through mn are fixed. We say that they generate m if this happens and m is called finitely generated if there is such a generating set. That's what this means. Okay. So, uh, there are um, um, not every module, okay, not every module. need be finitely generated uh, or let me not say it that way let me not let me just give you an exercise for example consider q the group of rational numbers this is an abelian group and therefore it is a z module is not finitely generated as an abelian group or what it it's not finitely generated as a z module okay that's a good exercise for uh, people to try if you don't immediately see it okay and so uh, usually in msc courses you have this no uh, you you study the structure theorem structure theory of finitely generated modules over a P over a P I D. This stands for principal ideal domain. And for example, such a the ring of integers is a principal ideal domain. Uh, so let us recall what this um, principal ideal domain means. Domain um, 
So a commutative ring with identity is called a domain if it has no zero devices. Z has no zero devices, so it's a domain or an integral domain. The principal ideal domain means every ideal in it is generated by a single element. So uh, as we know, uh, ideals in Z are of the form ideals in Z are of the form NZ for some N bigger than or equal to zero. You can choose this N bigger than or equal to zero. Uh, and so in particular, every element of Z, every ideal in Z is principle. It is generated by a single element. And we study structure theory of finitely generated modules over a PID. So this is a, a subject that we study in master's courses in mathematics. So this is partly review. However, my approach to the subject uh, will be different. And I am, in fact, concentrating not just on finitely generated modules, but finite Z modules. In other words, finitely finite abelian groups. So what's a finite abelian group? So, uh, so for those of who, uh, to those of whom who have joined, who have joined late, you've not missed very much. Okay, we are just going to start here now. I'm going to define the basic objects of this talk: finite abelian groups. Right? These are just abelian groups whose uh, underlying set. is finite, as simple as that, OK? Uh, so what are examples of abelian groups, finite abelian groups, OK? Uh, well, there are, I would have ideally liked to ask you uh, for examples. But since uh, I guess this is one-way communication, I'm just going to uh, give the example myself, um, unless there is somebody who can unmute and uh, speak and tell me what the, um, give me an example. I guess that's still not possible, right? So let me just do this. So, so a group like this, it's a cyclic group of order n. OK, in some books, this is denoted z so when it's at, it's like this, but I'll use, I'll prefer to use this. Um, uh, so let, let me just go here and then erase this and give myself more room. Um, okay, the distraction is gone now. Okay. So that's a very basic example of a finite abelian group. We know that the order, order meaning the number of elements of this set is n, right? So, um, so when I write here n, n is a um, some positive integer. There is also a, a construction that we can do which will produce new finite abelian groups from old ones. And that's the following. If M and M prime are finite abelian groups, so is M direct sum M prime. So this is, uh, you know, this has a particular meaning, but in case you are not familiar with it, you can just think of this as the Cartesian product of M with M prime. And that is that is clearly an abelian group with the addition being component wise. M comma M prime plus if I have M1 plus M1 prime, sorry, M1 prime. Let me write that more clearly. M1 prime. This is equal to M plus M prime prime, sorry, 
This is M1. This is M1, comma, this is M1, okay. This is M plus M1, comma, M prime plus M1 prime, okay. So there is the notion of direct uh, sum, which is just the, you can think of it just as the Cartesian product, and that becomes an abelian group. And it's also a finite abelian group because um, the Cartesian product is of two finite sets is finite. In fact, if this has order something, say let's say P, and this has order Q, then the Cartesian product has order PQ, P times Q. So this is definitely finite and it's a group, it's an abelian group. And so this gives us a new finite abelian group. And the, okay, let me just at the f outset tell you what one of the one version, a, a naive version of the uh, theorem is. So here is a, a, a naive version of this, of the, of the main theorem of the, of the structure theorem, so of the structure theorem, which is what we are going to be talking about. Okay. A naive version of the structure theorem is, you can state it informally as follows. Cyclic groups uh, along with this construction gives you all groups. So let me state it like that. So this is a typical thing in mathematics. That is, you have some examples and you create new examples by com combining the known examples in this known way. So, uh, you will get for example, if I combine, uh, for example, I could take z mod 3z, direct some z mod 3z. Now, that that gives me a new abelian group, meaning uh, from these original cyclic groups, I have produced something more, which uh, may or may not be cyclic. Okay, uh, so we have not said anything about... Uh, whether this we get something new here or not, but this is definitely given two things. I can produce something. Uh, produce this when I say something. Okay, let me let me start say it, say that again. So, given m and m prime, we can definitely produce m direct sum n prime. No problem. That gives us one one way to construct new groups from groups that we already know. Okay, now. Uh, suppose I take M to be one of these cyclic groups and M prime to be another of these cyclic groups and go through this process, I get a new, I get something, some group. Okay. Now it's a, it is possible that I get back a cyclic group. Or maybe what, it's, at the moment, this, we are, we are silent about that. Right. But the statement says, right. Uh, as as you probably already know, if I take uh, z mod 2 z and take direct sum with z mod 3 z, for example, then you will get z mod 6 z. Right? So you, in fact, there you get another cyclic group. On the other hand, if you can take z mod 3 z and direct sum with z mod 3 z, then the group that you get will not be cyclic. Okay. So this construction sometimes gives a group that you know in cyclic but in other cases it gives you group a group that is not cyclic okay of course you can repeat this construction you can you can take you can uh, take 10 of them and combine the first two in some way in this way take the direct sum of the first two and then take the take the direct sum of the third one with that the direct sum is an associative uh, uh, commutative uh, operation and therefore uh, you know, uh, if I take uh, five, uh, say, groups and form their direct sum, it does not matter which order I form it in. I can talk about the direct sum of these objects, and um, that will give me a new object. Right? When I say a new object, I, I only mean it's a potentially something that we have not seen before. Okay? So, the 
the naive theorem of the naive version of the structure theorem says that every abelian group every finite abelian group that's the that's the, the those are the objects we are interested in is obtained by this process e is a direct sum of finitely many cyclic groups This is a very naive version of the theorem, but it's uh, very important. Mm. And uh, I hope this is clear that it's it's just saying that the simple-minded thing of taking the obvious objects, namely cyclic groups, and combining them in this obvious way produces everything that we want. Right? So. If we understand direct sums of finitely finite direct sums of cyclic groups, that's all there is to it. Okay. In fact, yeah, that's that's it. So that is the structure, that is one version of the structure theorem. So what uh, is uh, important, you know, further the non-naive version, the more the finer version of the theorem is about is how I mean what so so, for example, let's uh, to explain that. Let me uh, write out in notation what this means. So, given uh, M, right, this abelian group, given M, finite abelian group, okay, there exist integers. There exist uh, integers. M1, Mn bigger than 2, such that I, the reason why I'm taking them bigger than or equal to 2 is that if I take them equal, if one of them is equal to 1, then uh, Z mod 1Z is 0. So that's why I'm not considering that, um, such that uh, M is Z mod M1Z. Direct sum dot 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 z mod m n z. Right. Maybe it's good to, for me to instead rather than n, let me use just k here. Maybe that is better psychologically. Okay. So this is what this says, right? That's just a mathematical way of writing out this English, what is said in plain English here that every finite abelian group is a direct finite direct sum of cyclic groups. Right? The question is, for example, is this is this uh, decomposition so is so here is a question are m1 to mk unique I hope you understand what this question means, right? If I write it this way, maybe you found m1, m2, mk such that m is isomorphic to this direction. Maybe I can start uh, with m and produce and some other set of integers. Let's say m1 prime, m2 prime, maybe ml prime. And even the number can be different. Here there are k of them, but maybe the, even the number is different such that m is also isomorphic to z mod m1 z direct sum m1 prime z z mod ml prime z for example this is the, the and the answer you already know the know enough to answer this no so this is this is the answer is no this is not unique right and here is a simple example z mod 6 z is Z mod 3Z, direct sum Z mod 2Z. Okay, so um, this is definitely not going to be true because here I have just one integer, namely 6, 
but here I have two integers, three comma two. So even the number is not, uh, a, 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 you know, here I've written, this is a cyclic group and that I've written as a direct sum of two cyclic groups, right? So, so this decomposition is not unique, right? But if you are willing to give up the uniqueness, this may be, this is seen many applications. This is all what you want, right? So uh, to repeat, the first statement is this naive one that every finite abelian group is a direct sum of finitely many cyclic groups. Right, finitely many. Of course, it goes without saying that these cyclic groups are finite. Um, of course, in possibly non-unique ways. Right, and the whole point of this theorem uh, is to nail down the the finer structure theorem is to nail down uh, what in uh, how do you choose this m one through m k such that they are unique. Okay, that is that's what we want to do. Of course, we have just stated this. We have not even proved this. So maybe we can. It's about time that we started thinking about how to prove this. Okay. Okay. There are many different ways of approaching uh, this uh, problem. Uh, the one that I am going to choose today uh, is via what is called the Chinese remainder theorem. So let me. Um, I'll, I'll talk in a minute about the Chinese remainder theorem, but before we do that, let's get, so we're going towards the proofs. So let us warm up by looking at certain basic facts, some basic facts about finite good abelian groups. Okay, so let's so given so here is given an element M in M, and I'm always assuming M is a finite abelian group. There exists non zero integer. A in Z. So let's even make it positive such that A times M is zero. Right? Why is this? This is rather very easy to do. So if not, so A is an integer. Right? So I take M. I take 2m, I take 3m, and so on. So this is m plus m, remember? This is m plus m, m plus m plus m, and so on. And keep going, right? Now, you'll get, you can keep on going. So that's an, inf you can do this infinitely many times, 2, 2m, 3m, 4m, 5m, etc., etc. Keep going. And we produce elements on this side. 2m is an element, 3m is an element, 4m is an element. But we know that the set m is finite, the group is finite. So the only way this, uh, the, you know, it follows that there, you know, two of these must be the same, right? In fact, much more, you can make a much more uh, stronger statement, but all I need to know at the moment is that, you know, some km, is equal to some jm for let's say j bigger than k right k j not equal to k but without loss of generality i can assume j bigger than k which means j minus k times m is zero so th there you go this this you can choose to be a and a is not zero because j is not equal to k so this is even a positive integer okay that's all there is to it Okay, now, sorry. Um, given this, what you can do is that there exists, you can do even better. 
there exists a non-zero positive integer. Let me call it B, such that B annihilates the whole of M. B times M is zero. Okay. Why is this? It follows rather easily from the first one. So you have for every element you can choose some A, which is in which kills it. And all you need to do, there are finitely many elements. So write M is equal to M1, M2, Mn. Right? Uh, I can always write it like this. List out the elements. Right? Choose A1, A2, An positive integers. Such that a1 m1 is equal to a2 m2 is equal to dot 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 a and mn. It'll kill then b m1 equal to b mn. It kills every every element. Thus, b m is c. Um, it's actually enough to do this if you have if you have finitely generated a module with the property that every element is killed by some positive integer, then the whole module is killed. Here, of course, I'm. Uh, it's actually finite, and this is a rather weak statement. You can make slightly stronger statements, but let's not bother. So, what we understand is that that if you have a finite abelian group, then uh this there is a uh, positive integer b such that bm is zero okay so what does that tell us that tells us that this given a finite abelian group m Yes, was there a question? Maybe this is a good time to pause and ask if there are questions. So given a finite abelian group M, there exists. So what we can do is, so there is, it, it is a module. It's a Z module, of course, that's what we saw in the beginning, but it's a module over Z mod BZ. So that's the upshot. This is why we did all this, uh, this, uh, exercise about uh, some basic facts, right? So we are saying that if you have a finite abelian group, you can actually look at it as a module over this finite ring. Right? Rather than Z, we have come down to this ring. Okay. Uh, now, Now comes in, okay, I'll start a different color. So this is Chinese remainder theorem, which says that the Z mod BZ, you can write it as Z mod, so you take this B, right? This is a positive integer. Right, it's a module over Z mod B Z where this B is this 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 thing, right? And you write you take its uh, prime decomposition, so you can write it, let's say like this, where this is the you write it uniquely as a product of primes. We know that this is from the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Every positive integer can be written as uniquely as a product of prime factors, right? So this Z mod PZ is actually becomes a direct product like this. So what it helps us do is, so we started with a finite abelian group. 
we observed that it is a Z module. Then we have observed that it is a Z mod BZ module. And now we can further, by this decomposition, we can assume that this B is actually a prime power. That's the whole point. Now let us look at this Chinese Thermodynamic Theorem more co closely and actually maybe even look at the proof of it, etc. So for the next few minutes, let's concentrate on the Chinese Thermodynamic Theorem. I, I hope this has I have, I have uh, motivated why we want to look at it. The reason I repeat is the following. We have reduced to the case when we look at modules, finite modules over rings of this form, Z mod BZ, where B is some positive integer. Now, this theorem tells us that such rings, Z mod BZ, can be written as a direct product of rings of the form Z mod P to the sum power. That's the point. Okay, so let us understand uh, what the state and understand what the Chinese remainder theorem is in a little more generality perhaps than what is required for our purposes. Uh, this, you know, sometimes uh, looking at things a bit more generally always helps. Not always, but uh, sometimes. So this is one of those cases where uh, doing it a little more generality, it actually clarifies the matter, you know, it, it throws uh, a light on the situation. I believe this is one of those cases. So rather than doing it over Z, the ring of integers, let's do it a little more generally. So let me fix uh, A to be a commutative ring with identity. And then uh, let A be an ideal. So let A and B, so ideals A and B, I guess everyone is familiar with the notion of an ideal. Um, if the ring is not commutative, then you have right ideals and left ideals and two-sided ideals, etc. cetera. So, but since I've assumed that the ring is commutative, uh, all these notions coincide. We have just one notion of an ideal. So, and suppose I have two of them, A and B, are co-maximal. This is a definition. If they are sum, which is always an ideal. Okay, what is this? By What do I mean by their sum? This is A plus B, where A is in A, and B is in B. So it's the collection of all such elements. So this is, this is B. Uh, the collection of all such elements, and it's easy to check that this is an ideal. And if is the whole of A. If this ideal A plus B is the whole of A, such a um, set of ideals, pair of ideals, you call them co -max. Okay, now let us uh, give another uh, uh, equivalent definition of co -maximal, or let's make an observation. So here is the observation. Ideals A and B are co if and only if, There exists A in A and B in B such that A plus B is equal to 1. So A plus B equals 1, where 1 is the unit element. This is the multiplicative identity of the ring. So why is this? Now, if A plus B is the whole of A, then in particular 1 belongs to the set, and therefore 1 is equal to A plus B. There exists A and B such that 1 is equal to A plus B. So this is obvious. This is this is good. So one way. The other way, suppose I have A and B such that A plus B is 1, then I can write any element as something in A plus something in B just by taking this 
a plus b is equal to 1. And if I multiply, suppose I want to write some element of um, a, let's say x in a, I want to write x as, a, as something in a plus something, something in the ideal a plus something in the ideal b. All I need to do is multiply this equation by x and then I get x a plus x b is equal to x and this is in a and this is in b and therefore x belongs to this side okay right now um now that we have given a definition let's ask ourselves when are two ideals when are two ideals in Z for maximum. Okay. Now, note that a is, a Z is M1. So let's take those ideals to be M1Z, two ideals, these to be M1Z and M2Z. Okay. When are they co-maximal? So suppose I take um, all elements that are multiples of M1, all elements that are multiple of M2, and take their sum, right? So this is, as you may know, if you don't, uh, please do this as an exercise, M1 plus M2Z, this is an ideal, and that ideal because we are in Z, that ideal itself is, is you know, is a principal ideal. And so there is an integer, a positive integer, or at least non-negative integer, such that that ideal is that integer times Z. And what we are saying is that integer is M1, the highest common factor of M1 and M2. Okay, and so when are they co-maximal? So M1Z and M2Z are co-maximal when they add up to the whole ideal, which means if and only if the GCD of M1 and M2 is 1. Okay? Okay. Uh, now, some properties of co-maximal ideals. So let me... Okay. Let me use a different color for that. Okay, uh, that's not really visible on this background. So let me go to blue. If um, okay, let's say suppose A and B are co-maximal. Then their intersection is their product. Okay. Now, proof. Let's prove this. The intersection always contains the product. So, by the way, what do we mean by product? This, by definition, um, is the ideal generated by all those elements so let me write it like this, ideal generated by A times B, where A is in A and B is in B. And this is the set theoretic intersection. Okay, now this is, this is true in general, right? Because if I take A times B, that belongs to A because A is an ideal and it belongs to B because B is an ideal. So A times B belongs to both A and B. And so all these elements belong to both A and B. And therefore, when I take uh, the ideal generated by them, since all of these belong to A already, the ideal generated by them is contained in A. Similarly, it is contained in B. Therefore, it's contained in their intersection. So. It is, th so this is true in general. There is nothing here about, it doesn't require the co-maximality of A, A and B. 
It is this part of the theorem, this part of the assertion that requires a proof. So I take something in A times B. Why is it in A, B, right? Okay, so what we can do is, so let, let X B is in, let, let's suppose X is in A intersection B, right? Now, um, A and B are co-maximal, so A plus B is equal to, so there exists A and B in A, A rather, rather than say respectively, let's say there exists A in A and B in B, such that A plus B is one, right? That follows from the co-maximality of A and B, right? We saw that that's an equivalent condition. Um, now, given X is in A and B, A intersection B, how do I write it as something into A into something into A times B? So I can write uh, X is equal to um, X A, plus xb. Now, notice here, this is in ab because I'm this a is in a and this x is in a intersection b. Therefore, it's in b. And this is also in a intersection. So this is, this b is in b, but this x is in a. X is also in B, but that's not for here. I'm, I'm the, the, the relevant part is to say X is in A. So this is in AB. Both sides are, you know, both both ter both uh, terms, XA and XB are in the product AB. Therefore, that being an ideal, it contains the sum which is X. And so I, I've managed to get X is implies X is in AB. So this uses the fact that A plus B is equal to 1. There exists such A and B. In other words, that A, the ideals A and B are co-maximal. So without that, this is not true. Okay, so this, for this proposition, this is uh, the end of the proof. Okay, now, continuing with this, so, uh, what we want to say is that if uh, a uh, if a and b are co-maximal and a and c are co-maximal, then a and b c are co-maximal. Okay, how do we see this? Well, if A and B are co-maximal, then I know A plus B is equal to 1. If A and C are co-maximal, then I know that A prime, so I, let me not use this, you should not be using the same A because uh, this a this element here that appears and the element here that appears could be the same. A plus C is equal to one. Now, when I multiply these two together, I get A prime. So A plus so A plus B. So let's multiply these equations. Then I get A plus B times A prime plus C is equal to one, right? And then this side becomes A A prime plus A B. A C plus A prime B plus B C is equal to one. Well, this whole thing is contained in A because A prime is in A, A is in A, and, and here A and both, A prime both are in A. So I have an element of A which uh, when I add to B C, where B is, this is the this belongs to B times C because it is just this B and product of this B and this C, I get one. This proves this. Similarly, you can show, um, for example, A1. So here is a, here is a, let's quickly observe one more. If A and B are co-maximal, then 
so are a to the k and b to the l for any integers k comma l bigger than equal to okay how is that so what do we need to show here is the statement if a and b are co-maximal then you have one is equal to a plus b right and then you want to say a to the k and b to the l for any integers those are co-maximal so i want to so uh, i would have liked to ask you to raise this to some power and what's the uh, what the appropriate appropriate power would be etc but to save time let me just do it myself so if so take to the power n so let choose n which is much much bigger than k and l let's say in fact if it's bigger than k plus l minus i mean one that's good enough right then if you do and expect you know then you you get this by raising both sides to the n and now when you expand this when when you expand this using the binomial theorem which applies because a is a commutative ring every term so what are the terms here you will get a to the n minus i or a to the i and b to the n minus i right that's what you get a to the i b to the n minus i now n is bigger than or equal to k plus l minus 1 so either this is bigger than k bigger than or equal to k or this is bigger than or equal to l right this cannot be less than l k and this cannot be less than l if both are then I, I plus n minus i is less than k plus l minus 1. So that's not possible. Okay. So when you expand using binomial theorem, every term uh, is in is either in a power k or b power l. So if I collect all the terms that are in a power k and call that something alpha, collect all the terms that are in b power l, call it beta, then I, then I get an equation of the form 1 is equal to alpha plus beta. Okay, so uh, this is a good exercise. I've indicated a proof. So uh, if what I have said is not clear, uh, you would do well to think through that and make, make it clear to yourself. Okay, so much for co-maximal ideals. So what is the statement of the Chinese remainder theorem? So Chinese remainder theorem says, if let a1, a2, an be pairwise co-maximal, any two of them are co-maximal, ideals in a commutative ring A with identity. Okay, then, then you have a1 intersect an is equal to a1 times an and a mod a1 which is this is isomorphic to a mod a1 cross a mod a2 cross a mod a this has rings so 
So this is the statement of um, Chinese in the theorem. Okay. Now the way we will apply it is the following. So if if let's for a minute before going to prove this, let's apply it to the situation that we want. So you see B. So let recall how we want to apply this. M is a finite abelian group, and then we saw that um, Z, it's a module not just over Z, but Z mod BZ for some appropriate choice of B. And now we want to do is you take this B is equal to B, P1 to the R1, P2, PK to the RK, right? Okay. Then uh, just think of this as ideals now. BZ is P1 R1Z PK to the RK Z. Now, look at what we have said here. But these, these are co -max, pairwise co maxima. P1 to the R1, PK to the RK. Okay, let's put a uh, Z there. Z comma PK to the RKZ are pairwise co maxima. Are pairwise co maxima. Okay, so uh, this theorem applies to um, this case, this this bunch of ideals. So what we get if we apply this is that Z mod their intersection, which is also their product, and the product is BZ. So BZ is isomorphic to Z mod P1 to the R1Z cross and so on, Z mod PK to the RKZ. Right. So you do get it immediately as an application of this. Now, the way we will use it is that uh, you you take the Z mod BZ and then um, if you so let me just finish with that. Now if I will prove the Chinese remainder theorem next time, but what we can do immediately is that you take this M and since it's a module over Z mod BZ, I can write it like this, right? But this I can replace by uh, Z mod P1 to the R1Z product, right? As so, so what I get is that you'll get Z mod P1 to the R1Z M cross Z mod P K to the R K Z M. So uh, this notation may be a bit strange and maybe a bit misleading also. What it means is that there are submodules of M. Uh, these will be submodules of M because th these are quotients of Z mod M. Uh, these are subrings of Z mod uh, BZ. Okay, so we have this. Uh, decomposition here. Okay, let me be more careful. So this is a, I, I don't want to call it a subring. This is a, this is a, this is an ideal. This, this will be an ideal. You can think of this as an ideal inside this, and this as an ideal inside that. Okay, and so when I multiply this ideal with the module, that's what I mean here cross or direct sum is the same thing. So I get this M as a direct sum of this ideal times M across dot 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 this ideal times M. So this gives us a decomposition of M and this is called the, these are called the M primary, comp, sorry, the primary components uh, of the module M. But uh, I, I'll just stop here because I'm out of time today and we will continue next time. I will start, uh, we will talk, we will prove the Chinese remainder theorem 
and see how that helps us in decomposing a finite abelian group into its primary components. This is so you may have heard of the primary decomposition theorem in in, uh, in the context of linear algebra, and this is primary decomposition for the for a, for the case of finite abelian group, and the two are uh, not just uh, related; they are uh, they are in fact the same. You can say in some way. We'll see, anyway. We'll see more of this next time. So, okay, I am now uh, ready to begin my lecture. Uh, before I begin, I welcome you all once again uh, the, for those of you who joined a little late. So, I am going to talk on uh, matrix exponentiation. So, we are all familiar with uh, the exponential function. Uh, so, t goes to e power t, and which has very nice properties. It's a very important function. Uh, this is uh, for t a scalar, so t in real numbers or t in complex numbers. Okay, this we are familiar with. Now we want to generalize this uh, to the context of. So the, my whole series of talks is going to be based on the following. So you have a certain um, map. Okay. Let me write here. M N power. Uh, you can replace. Uh, you can work with uh, uh, n by n matrices with real coefficients or m n by n matrices with complex coefficients. So or uh, m n c to m n c, m n c, and of course uh, what we would like to do is uh, send x a matrix x. To a matrix which will be denoted e power x, it will have the obvious meaning, and so the formula is the same whether if x is uh, in one of the two, x is in m n of r or n by n matrices of C. Okay, uh, but before I begin to do that, let me just say a few words about uh, mm, the uh topology of r or uh, you know how we yeah so mn of r so uh, let me just uh, concentrate on reals uh, similar statements are also valid so we want to regard this as a vector space this is indeed a vector space is a real vector space vector space uh, of dimension so with square matrices of dimension n square. So you may just write to that. Think of this as R n square, and in R n square you have the Euclidean metric, which gives the topology here and so on. Okay. We will be working with a slightly a different norm, not the Euclidean norm, but we want to work with uh, some other norm, matrix norm. Uh, it is uh, so if if A is in uh, uh, is an n by n matrix R or C, it doesn't matter. Uh, then uh, this matrix norm is defined to be denotes denotes. Okay, so. Uh, this number, which is uh, maximum of the absolute values of the entries a i j, uh, one less than or equal to i, comma j less than or equal to n, uh, where a i j are the entries of a i j is the i j entry of this. Okay, is this clear? Yeah. And uh, we, of course, uh, you can do calculus on. Um, we can we can do calculus on R n. So uh, we do that. Let me just say that recall. Recall what it means to have a smooth function. 
let's say from hour or sometimes an interval to smooth curve okay in the space of mn of r mind you this is just r n square as a vector space so real vector space i have a curve here for each t i get some curve sigma uh, an image sigma t and uh, of course this is matrix valued so it will have uh, matrix cohesion sigma ij of t okay and of course this is just uh, another way of writing you know a vector having n square component but we write it in this fashion because we want to think of the image as a matrix uh what is what does it mean to say sigma is smooth okay we say sigma is smooth sigma is smooth smooth if each component sigma ij of t is a smooth function is a smooth function function of t all right so t varies here in real numbers throughout you can change r by c there will be no problem slight appropriate modification may be required that's all all right uh, important uh, property of this we want to know what is the derivative so recall again if sigma is smooth sigma from r or all we carry some neighborhood uh, some interval open interval containing origin but nevertheless write mn of r doesn't matter uh, r to mn of r if this is smooth then what is sigma dash of t sigma dash of t is a derivative okay there is just a sigma dash ij of t so that is a, so this is now the moment you write fix ij this is a real valued function and so derivative has a natural meaning so let me expand that this is just compute d by dt uh, sigma prime sigma of t sigma ij of t okay so at the ij the component whatever you have you just replace that by uh yeah uh, the derivative and that's the meaning of sigma prime one important formula which will be extremely helpful i will write it in the next page okay is the following so if uh so t i'll briefly write like this a of t and t goes to b of t b of t or smooth function smooth curves in mn of t that's a language okay then you can form the product of matrices then t goes to a t b t mind you the order matters because the matrix multiplication is not commutative so you write like this this is also a smooth curve is also a smooth curve smooth curve and let us simply write this as uh, c t okay this is let us just denote this as c t then the question is what is the derivative formula for derivative of c t so d by d t of c t which is just uh, some a a t times b t is equal to uh, so yeah this is the formula or lemma so exactly like in the real variables uh, real valued function of a real variable so this is d by dt of a t times b t plus you have to mind the order that's the main difference a t d by dt of b t and in short notation in short notation c prime of t 
is equal to a prime t times b t plus uh, a t times b prime of t. This is in short notation. Yeah. So that's uh, that's a very extremely useful fact. Uh, I'll just give a short proof of this. I will write here i d and then a t b t prime is equal to this. So okay, you just write the i j the entry of c t. Okay, i j the entry of c t is uh, matrix multiplication. So a i j a i k of t b k j of t. All right. So when you take the derivative, so this is summation is over k. K is equal to one to n. And then C prime ij of t. You are just looking at this as just to freeze i and j. Then you have this curve. This is from this is from R to R. Okay. I'm just taking derivative for the time being fix i and j. If you like, I write that fix i comma j. Okay. And then you have this formula. So now you can write the derivative. That's equal to derivative. I can take it inside the summation. Now apply the usual uh, product formula for derivative. That tells me I have a prime i k of t times b k j of t plus a i k of t times b prime k j of t okay and the summation is over k to n and then you just write the summation twice separately for each one of these some sum, summands so a prime i k t i know i'm going a little slow but we will speed up early soon plus summation this okay i'm not going to write it just copy that down and this is now you look at look here this is just the ij the entry of so therefore c prime of t that's all this is the ij the entry of the matrix a prime t times b of t plus now this is the ij the entry of a t times b prime t. okay so we have that formula. It's a very handy formula. And now I will uh, need one other fact, but I will say that uh, after introducing the definition of exponentiation. So uh, let us at the moment write E. Well, OK. So I write here X from MN of either real numbers or complex numbers. It doesn't really matter. Just to be specific, let me write real numbers. Exactly same formula holds in the case of complex. So what is this map? Um, so I take x and like I said, this goes to e power x so or x x. And it is defined to be summation uh, k equals 0 to infinity. Uh, x power k divided by k factorial. All right. Now, this requires some explanation. You see, anytime you have an infinite sum, you need to worry about convergence. And so you have to ask yourself, why is this convergent? First of all, before you can talk about convergence, you need to ask yourself whether you are in a topological space. Like I already told you, this is R n, R n square isomorphic to the most natural way or n square okay so it make yes so it makes sense to ask whether it is convergent or not and now in order to do that we will uh, uh, analyze what is the meaning of this so the ij the entry what is the ij the entry of this exponentiation of x I will take ij the entry of that. This is summation over uh, x power k. It's a complicated thing. Whatever it is, I look at the ij the entry. 
divide by k factorial sum it from 0 to infinity and now this is an infinite sum of uh, real numbers okay this is something we understand whatever be the answer that's what you want to put as the ijth entry of this that's the meaning of this but the question is whether it is convergent or not whether it is meaningful what happens if it becomes infinite and in order to take care of that you need to estimate so you need to estimate uh, yes, ijth entry of x power k in terms of the entries of x, okay. So that's what we are going to do now, okay. So there the following fact will become important, uh, fact. So, uh, norm of a b is less than or equal to uh, yeah n times norm of a times norm of b for all n by n matrices a b in m n in matrices real number or real numbers you can have our complex numbers also and it's identical uh, inequality poles okay why is it so let me just give a proof of this uh, because this is going to be a, a crucial role and mind you this n is same as the size of the matrix so it doesn't vary with a and b it's independent of this constant is independent of a and b okay let's just very quickly give a proof so write uh, as before right c is equal to a times b so what is the uh, ij the entry of this again we write the same thing summation a i k b k j is nothing and now we want to estimate this absolute value of c i j is well less than or equal to let me save a step absolute value of a i k times the absolute value of b k j okay now I remove this one from each one of the factors and replace it by the maximum possible. This is sum of sum is over k. I have fixed my i and j. Okay, so this is less than or equal to norm of the matrix A times summation. See, each one of these is replaced by norm summation B K J. But each one of these BKJ will be uh, dominated by norm of B. So this K is equal to 1 to 1 to N. Yeah. So this is less than or equal to norm of A times uh, summation. So there are N terms. Each one of them I replace by this. So this will become N times norm of B. Is that clear? So, so that proves this one. And as a consequence, therefore, what do we get? In particular, taking a power k, uh, this is less than or equal to, you can prove this, n power k minus 1, this is by induction or repeatedly applying this, times norm of a, norm of a power k, sorry. And this will bound it just put another n power k a power k all right and now what you do is go back to the definition of uh, what you want to prove as convergent so you see uh, the ij the entry there exponential whatever i have written down so exponential the ij the entry exponential First you take exponential and then take the ijth entry. That is, well, I had already written it down. Let me just copy that. X power k, uh, ijth entry, and then divide by k factorial. And this one, now we got a bound, okay? So this is, of course, bound by, this is less than or equal to summation. This is so in the place of x you have a so this is replaced by norm x power k if you like i write one more step x power k by uh, sorry the k is inside 
k is inside first not outside by k factorial and now so that is of course k is going from 0 to infinity and this is less than or equal to uh, summation okay so n power k norm x power k divided by k factorial and this is equal to exponential uh, yeah so the I, you can put absolute value here no problem and when you do that yeah everywhere you can put absolute value and here already that's the same so e power n norm x yeah so the terms of this series in a norm vector space are dominated by this uh, n times norm x okay corresponding term of that all right and this shows that so this inequality shows hence the this the series converges x power whatever x power k uh, by k factorial uh, k going from 0 to infinity converges converges absolutely and the convergence is uniform on compact sets the convergence is uniform uniform on actually bounded sets or let me say here compact sets because what matter here is norm x if norm x is bounded by some capital r no matter whatever you have that's all bounded by e power n times r so so the individual terms are all bounded by that and so just uh, uh yeah sequence converges uh yeah so uh that's right so that that proves the uh so this this proves that hence the x, x going to exponential map exponential x this one is meaningful x power k by k factorial k equals zero to infinity is yeah is meaningful meaningful uh, uh, and yeah so you see um and is an actually an analytic function analytic function of the matrix entries of the xij where x is equal to xij okay so all that follows from just this basic observation so why is it that this is important uh, there are several things uh, which sort of uh, um, i mean properties of the exponential function which carry over but there are also subtle differences and this has wide application both within uh, i mean it has very wide applications uh, i will probably talk about applications later but first let us establish some basic properties of the exponential matrix exponentiation the first one i already stated but let me state this so theorem uh, we will write here after e power x okay so x going to e power x let me write that x going to e power x is um, yeah so this is equal to in terms of power series x power k by k factorial is absolutely convergent convergent and uniformly uniformly so on compact sets compact subsets of the matrix space mn of r okay this is the first property that we would like to say the second is the following 
Yeah. Sorry. Two. So you look at the following. So fix x. Uh, let me just since it's a fix a in M N of space of matrices and cross n matrices. Then we obtain a curve. We we have a function curve. So R two again M N of R. So what is this curve? T goes to e power and uh, t times a. Yeah. So this is a smooth function. It's smooth with the derivative. Yeah. A times e power t x. That is. In symbols, d by dt of e power t a is equal to a e power t a. Okay. At all points, all right. So if a and b third property, if a and b commute. These are both uh, n cross n matrices. Okay, I will not say that repeatedly. M n of R uh, such that R such that A B equal to B A. Then they just behave like numbers. You see, then e power A plus B. Is equal to e power a times e power b. Okay, but this condition is important. Without this condition, you don't expect this. This is not true. And fourth, so e power x, so e power exponentiation. I write in this way. Takes values. Yeah, uh, M N of R maps into actually the general linear group G L N of R. So this is space of all invertible matrices. Okay, uh, why is that? In fact, in fact, what is E power A whole inverse? I am saying it is invertible. Then what is the inverse? This is just E power minus of A. Okay. Yeah. So let us uh, um, try to prove some of these things. I yeah, I will prove actually everything in this one. Okay. This is a basic result. Let me prove these things for you. Uh, but maybe not give complete proof. So outline of proofs. The first one I have already uh, commented about. So take two onwards. Uh, what what do we want to prove? We want to prove that d by dt of uh, e power t a is equal to a times e power t a. Just like uh, in the case of numbers, if as if a is just a number, why is that? Okay. So you write here. You see the advantage is that this sequence. So let's write this e power t a. This is equal to summation on t power k a power k by k factorial k going from zero to infinity. When you think of it as a function of the variable t, this is still uh, absolutely convergent uh, function. Okay, uh, and uh, it is uh, uh, um, uniformly so uniformly convergent on compact sets. Uh, because of that, you can just do term by term differentiation. Uh, term by term derivative exists and. It converges to the derivative 
uh, of the of this function uh, so so i can just briefly say by one hmm? so i can just do this this is basic calculus multivariate calculus is equal to summation so you just differentiate it d by dt of t power n a uh, sorry i write t power k a power k uh, divided by k factorial and of course k goes from 0 to infinity so that becomes uh, summation k times so a is just a constant matrix okay or a power k is now a constant matrix and then i just multiply each coordinate by each matrix entry by t power k and then differentiate it i will get k t power k minus 1 a power k by k factorial yeah. <clears throat> uh, so this is equal to i pull out an a of course k equals 0 to can, can be forgotten and when i do that i will get uh, a times summation uh, yeah so t power k minus 1 by a power k minus 1 by k minus 1 factorial and k goes from 1 to infinity okay and that is of course exactly the exponentiation a e power t a okay. all right so the next one uh, probably hmm, i should uh, say uh, all right let's just give a quick proof of that I will do it fast. It, it involves a certain trick. Uh, e power, consider this e power t a times e power t a plus b. Okay. E power t a plus b. Think of this as a curve and then take derivative of this. Okay. What is this? This is equal to, uh, yeah, remember the derivative rule for differentiating product of two matrices so here i have one one curve of matrices another curve in the space of matrices so this is derivative of this so minus a times e power minus ta applying whatever we just now saw e power uh, the second factor is the same okay now i must keep the first factor the same e power minus t a times yeah derivative of this factor and when i do that i will yes so here you have to be a bit careful uh yeah, yeah. okay let me write this so i yeah let me write d by dt here is where commutativity of uh, a and b will be needed okay so so you see you the main let me write this as an aside in general a plus b power n for matrices doesn't have the same form as the binomial thing but it will be a, a lot more complicated uh, but this is same thing as you know summation over n choose k uh, let me write here m here m choose k uh, yeah a m choose k a power k m uh, b power m minus k provided a and b commute so that is if a and b commute commute and when you use this this term uh, you see you will need to expand uh, t a plus b whole power k and then differentiate okay so i skip a few steps but that's where because a and b commute you can collect powers of a uh, on one side powers of b on the other side otherwise you will not be able to do that so the next step is where i'm using commutativity and that leads to so together with this fact observation minus a e power minus t uh, a 
times e power t a plus b uh, and then <clears throat> plus e power minus t a uh, times so just differentiate this one i get a e power uh, t a plus b and this a can be brought to the front and now that's exactly cancelling with this one so this is equal to zero okay so you have something which is uh, some curve uh, when you differentiate it it always gives you zero that means that it's a constant function and that constant can be evaluated just by putting t equals zero so after saying those words which i don't want to write to just to, to save time so okay d by dt let me write that e power minus t a e power uh, t a plus b this is a constant yeah this is equal to this is identically zero no matter what value of t is so this implies that e power minus t a times e power t b t a plus b is a constant matrix and that constant matrix has to be the value at t equals zero when you put t equals zero this becomes identity this becomes e power b okay put t equals one t equals one then you get e power minus a and okay e power minus a and e power uh, t a e power a plus b is equal to e power b okay yeah this uh, well okay so uh, but yeah this this implies that now you um put uh, put b equal zero okay put b equal zero put b equal zero that gives me what e power minus a times e power a is equal to e power zero zero matrix which is actually identity so e power minus a is the inverse of e power e power a whole inverse and once you observe this, you can take it to the other side. And now it says, therefore, for any A and B, A, B commuting, therefore, for any A, B uh, commuting matrices, A, B equal B, A, B, A, we have, we can take this to the other side, this to the other side, and then rewrite this by multiplying by the inverse of that, which is we know is e power A, so e power a plus b is equal to e power a plus times e power b okay <clears throat> all right so now yeah this is a very important uh, thing uh, uh, already we showed that so uh, the ex so along the way we showed the following we showed that uh, I think I labeled it as some statement. What was it? Statement four, I think. Exponential map takes values in this one. So we already observed this in the course of the proof of this. Okay. I think uh, maybe these are all um, perhaps, uh, you know, uh, too formal let me now do an example okay i want to before proceeding further an example it's high time i did an example or let me write examples number one so let a be diagonal matrix a is equal to a1 blah 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 a n zeros elsewhere diagonal matrix diagonal matrix then we just explicitly compute what is e power a in there but before that you have to compute now this time we are not going to apply any theorem we just explicitly compute it what is a power k for a diagonal matrix it is the k to powers of the diagonal entries a n power k okay and therefore what is summation this 
e power a is equal to summation a power k by k factorial uh, that's equal to so summation this whole thing let me write that for once a power a1 power k blah 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 a k a n power k and here let me write uh, yes divided by k factorial and sum from k equal 0 to infinity now take the sum within this and that becomes uh, diagonal yeah this is a1 power k by k factorial blah 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 a n power k by k factorial so this okay all right okay so now what is do you recognize this this is of course e power a1 blah 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 e power a n diagonal matrix okay zero else back okay <clears throat> but let me do one example where it's not a diagonal matrix so take a to be a matrix of this form uh, a comma minus a 0 0 2 by 2 matrix okay m2 of r and we are going to explicitly calculate the exponential and so that means that we should do some calculation so what is a square you can explicitly calculate it a square is well uh, so minus a square then 0 0 minus a square and what is a cube so just do a few things then it will become clear what the pattern is this is minus a square times identity and then that when you multiply once more with a i will get each of the entries of a multiplied by minus a square so i get zero minus a cube a cube zero let us do one more so maybe i write here a power four well you can just square this that is a power four a power four zero here zero here and then the pattern continues then you can compute a power 5 and so on all right but i will uh, rewrite it in a slightly different way maybe okay mm. yeah maybe this is better and this i said that minus a square times identity and this is minus okay actually this is uh, uh yeah so yeah i don't know what to write here minus a cube let us keep this as such i want to simplify this how, how is this related to this yeah minus a square times minus a square times minus a square times a and this is a power 4 times identity and so on so now we will compute uh, the exponential of a e power a is equal to identity plus a plus a square by 2 factorial and plus a cube by 3 factorial minus plus okay a power 4 by Four factorial and so on so i keep this identity and then let's look at these even terms okay a square was already minus a square term times identity that's a two factorial and then next to look at a even power so i'm just a power four times by four factorial times identity and so on Okay, next two term is going to be negative. We can actually see that. Next two term is negative. And so on. Okay. And I'm not done yet. I have to collect now the odd degree terms. Uh, so that was 
starting with a mm, is equal to plus a and then r degree a cube that was uh, minus yeah so so that was uh, minus a square terms actually i could have written it in a slightly different yeah let me write this also this is uh, i can write this as a times this matrix 1 minus 1 now things become easier if you re realize this so a cube then becomes uh, this is a cube minus a cube times okay this matrix 1 0 1 minus 1 and then you can compute a power 5 and so on it will have the fifth power so let me write that so here i uh, i'm going to write here a so this a itself i will write in that particular fashion okay so i write here a uh, times that matrix which is 1 minus 1 off diagonal entry and other entries are 0 and then minus a cube by 3 factorial same matrix 1 minus 1 and plus a power 5 now the pattern is clear a power 5 by 5 factorial 1 minus 1 it's the same everyone will have a factor of a in it and that factor of a had been written as a times 1 minus 1 okay now do you recognize this first of all this this one is easy to recognize that is well cos a times identity matrix and this one only a cube a a cube minus a cube by 3 factorial all that can be uh, taken out this matrix 1 0 0 1 minus 1 0 being the same uh, i will here yes so a minus a cube by 3 factorial plus a power 5 by 5 factorial plus uh, minus and so on times 1 minus 1 this matrix and that is exactly when you simplify it this is of course we understand sign yeah so cos a times identity plus sin a times this matrix 1 minus 1 and that is nothing but the rotation matrix cos a sin a minus sin a cos a and surprisingly put a equals pi small a equals pi what do you get this is true for any a so you get that exponential of so pi minus pi that's equal to minus identity ah. you see minus one is uh, not uh, exponential of any real number but in matrix in space of two by two matrices minus identity is exponential of this particular matrix okay all right so one can do examples like this and i give as an exercise for you to try at home uh, it would have been uh, nice to have a live interaction but unfortunately this medium uh, doesn't allow me to do that so uh, compute exponential of uh, matrix one one okay so let's just write here t t zero zero instead of t minus t i write t t of diagonal yeah, anti diagonal uh, it come uh, you will get some interesting answer here uh, exactly following you know whatever i did here okay uh, let me see I want to talk about some more properties. These are very important and interesting properties. Okay. And once I do that property, then I will do some more examples. Okay. Property. Uh, 
already we saw some properties of exponentiation. Okay. So you take uh, let um, P be in. I'm mostly talking about reals, but you see, everything is formal. It really doesn't matter. You can work with either the real numbers or complex numbers, and things will work. Okay. You saying? Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I want to write here GL, invertible n by n matrix. So GL n no, and A is in M n of R. N by N matrix, not necessarily invertible. And you would like to know the following. So I take exponential P A P inverse. So let me write here then. So property. This is equal to P exponential A P inverse. By the way, sometimes I write e power a, sometimes I write exponential a. Yeah. So, uh, what about exponential of a transpose? So this t transfer not power t but transpose. Okay. This is equal to well. Exponential of a transpose, and yeah, we already know how to work with the inverse here, but at the moment maybe yeah. So sub, let me make one more statement. This is about uh, uh, suppose that complex numbers. So suppose a is in M n of C. Then I can also talk about conjugation. Then uh, exponential of a bar is exponential of a whole bar. So bar is complex conjugation. Yeah, is that uh, clear? I suppose. Uh, let. Yeah, maybe just one more statement, but maybe I will talk more about this later. Determinant of see determinant of exponential a exponential a of a is an invertible matrix, whatever it is. Okay, I can take determinant of it, and then I should get something non-zero. Okay, it's uh, very interesting. It turns out to be it's a number. It's a real number or a complex number, depending on whether A is real or complex. Interestingly, it turns out to be exponential of trace of A. Yeah. So uh, let us uh, try and prove at least some of these. This is a very important property for number one, and we will make very uh, it will be extremely useful when it comes to computation, and I will tell you why it becomes handy when it comes to computations. Okay, so let us prove this. I will just uh, write a very brief and formal proof. Some steps may require some uh, further explanation, but let me not bother about that. Okay, so what is this exponential p a p inverse? Just apply the definition. This is equal to summation p a p inverse over k by k factorial. Okay, I'm not going to write each time k equals zero to infinity. Okay, it's understood. This is equal to well p a p inverse power k. You know, simplifies. You just play with it a little bit, and you realize that this is p a power k. P inverse a factorial, all right. But that same thing as well. Now k equals zero. It's an infinite sum. If it was a finite sum, 
then I can take P out this side and K out that side. But then the convergence properties of the exponential uh, matrix exponential I uh, that was already remarked upon tells you that I mean this is just P K power K by K factorial. Doesn't matter if it's an infinite sum. Actually, what you are using is con uh, continuity of the exponentiation function. That's exactly P exponential A, P inverse. Okay, so conjugation uh, commutes with exponentiation in that sense. Uh, yeah. And what was the next thing that I wanted to say? Yeah, this is a, this is, I skip the proof of this, is absolutely, uh, I mean, trivial remark, just transposition everywhere you will have instead of, uh, you know, A power K transpose, A transpose K, they, they are commuting operations and that gives you the answer. So nothing to say there. Uh, here also, the exponential A bar, and uh, the bar of the exponential that commutes and this one determinant of exponential of a uh, same as this one uh, let me give a proof of that okay and we will uh, prove this assuming that uh, we are working with the complex matrices okay and in fact uh, uh, one can prove it completely within real, uh, uh, if you are working with real matrices, uh, one has to give a proof uh, completely using real matrices, but it, this is a much simpler way of doing it. There are, there are ways to handle that, let me not go into that, but suppose, so two for four. Um, what is the, yeah, so, um, yeah, so, so given, given any matrix A in uh, MN of C, it can be upper triangularized. If you recall that statement, there exists, there exists an invertible matrix. Invertible matrix P, uh, Mn of C, such that, yeah, even if you choose uh, entries of A to be real, you may have to go to complex numbers, okay? It depends on where the eigenvalues live and so on. So that's why this, uh, okay, so, such that P A P inverse is equal to some matrix which I will call B which is upper triangular. Upper triangular. And uh, so let me just write this as Bij. Okay. So we know that uh, exponentiation, yeah, so uh, exponential PAP inverse and then computing determinant is the same thing as determinant of. So you simplify this by property A, P exponential A, P inverse. Yeah. But determinant is invariant under conjugation or similarity. So this is determinant of uh, exponential of A. Yeah. So if I can compute this, so let me write this. This is same thing as determinant of exponential of B. And so it remains only to compute the determinant of exponential of B. So write B is equal to B. What do I know about B? Uh, it will be B1, well, actually B11, BNN. And then some star here, and here it is zero. Now, what is uh, so? 
what is the shape of b power k for any k see if it is upper triangular okay product of two upper triangular matrices will be in upper triangular and the diagonal entries will be product of the corresponding diagonal entries so if you just apply this this will look like b11 power k blah 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 bnn power k and then something here which i don't really care about and now we'll just uh, continue with my calculation of exponential of b exponential of b uh, well i really don't want this i only want the determinant but how the shape of this matrix looks like so i i, I just observe from what i have already said is upper triangular and this implies that uh, okay with the, i want to say one more thing with the diagonal entries diagonal entries entries well you can compute that see so the contribution to the diagonal will only be the di diagonal entries of these b power k okay so that actually gives you exponential so this is something you can just check e power b11 e power b22 so on e power b n n and what does that mean this means that therefore uh, determinant of exponential of b hmm, is equal to product of the diagonal entries of that upper triangular matrix because it's an upper triangular matrix determinant is just the product of the diagonal entries so when you do that you get this plus b n n but that same thing as e power trace of b okay but trace of b is again conjugation invariant so trace of b is a trace of p a p inverse and that same thing as e power trace of a because you see trace of x y is same as same as trace of y x so this p inverse i can carry to this side and that will cancel my p and so i'll just simply get a so this is exactly what we wanted to prove qed so so this is a very interesting fact and uh, this will have some significance later on um that i have many more things to say about these things but these are some of the basic properties um i think my time is up it's 4:30 and nagraj so my topic of my lectures are group actions so let's define what is group action first okay so like so groups are very important notion in algebra and there actually every group you can think of as arising out of an some bijective kind of thing so that's what i wanted to okay so let x be a set non empty set okay. now look at set up all bijections from x to x so denote px is set of all functions from x to x x is f is bijective <clears throat> so note that if f and g two elements in px so then we can compose 
F and G. So again, F is a bijection from X to X, and G is a bijection from X to X. I can compose and I get a bijection, which is denoted by F composed with G. See? So, so on BX, we have an operation. Operation. G circle F, which is called the composition of F with G. Okay. And note that identity of X that is equal to X is a bijection and hence identity of x is in the set bx set of all bijections okay and if f is a bijection and also note that if it, if f g h belongs to bx okay then look at this operation x to x go via f and then go, go via f apply f look at the bijection and then apply g and then apply h so first you get a bijection by looking at f compose g you get a bijection like this f compose g and then if you look at compose with h so what you get is a bijection this way h compose with g compose with f okay but i can first compose g and h so i can do that g circle h i have this bijection and then i pre compose with f okay so then i get a bijection again This is H compose G compose F. Yep. Okay. So you can verify this. This both these compositions are same. So in, in other words, what we are saying is that this is H compose with G circle F acting upon X is same thing as h g acting on f of x this also equal to h compose g of x so two way of composing if you have given three things is equal that's what we say so this is called the associativity of composition so this composition is associative so this property is called the associativity 
and also you have one more thing if f is a bijection is a bijection then f inverse is again a bijection In other words, what it satisfies, this F inverse satisfies this. F composed F inverse is equal to identity of X. And this also equal to F inverse composed with F. Okay. And if you compose any element identity of X, compose F is also equal to f is also equal to f compose identity of x okay so that means that implies hence vx with the composition law is a group recall a group is a consists of a set non empty set and a binary operation that is bx cross bx meaning g cross if g is a group so let me recall the definition call a group G is a pair G comma dot where say non empty set and dot is a binary operation that means take g cross g to g there is an operation <coughs> g1 g2 going to g1 dot g2 this is the binary operation so <coughs> which satisfies One, there exists an element E for the identity of the group group G said that. G comma E equal to G equal to E G dot E is same thing as equal to G and also it is same thing as E dot G. Okay, existence of identity to this uh, operation dot multiplication operation, sometimes it is called is dot is associative. That is G one dot G two dot G three is equal to G one dot G two dot G three for all G one G two G three in G satisfies this, and the third one is. For every element, the existence of inverse. For every G in G, there exists G inverse. 
an element in G such that satisfying G dot G inverse is equal to G e equal to G inverse dot G. Okay, this is the existence of inverse. So group is a non-empty set together with a binary operation. That means it's a mapping from G cross G. G cross G consists of pair of elements coming from elements of G, okay? G1, G2, which are G1 and G2 are elements of G. And for each pair, we have another element associated with it, which we denote by G1 dot G2 and which satisfies all these three conditions. Namely, there is an element E in the group G, which satisfies the property that when you multiply any element G with E, you get back G itself. Or you multiply E with G or G with E, you get the element, the G itself. And the the multiplication or the, the binary operation that we have defined also satisfies this property. Composition, which, which is called associativity. Compose first two things and take the action of the third. The same thing as compose second and third and then take the action of the first. So these, three th these two things are equal. So such a thing is called associativity. This should hold for all the elements G1, G2, G3 in the that G, okay? And existence of inverse, okay? So, so group arises naturally if you start with a set X. That's what I wanted to say. So that is what I have mentioned here. If you start with any set and look at the set of bijection, which satisfies this property. The, for the binary operation, you take the composition of bijections, okay? And for identity, you take the identity of the set map. That is, x going to x is the bijection. You take that. That has the property of the identity. And this composition is associative. And for because we are only looking at bijection, every bijection has an inverse, okay? which satisfies this property, F composed with F inverse is equal to X. So in other words, what we are saying is BX with the composition is a group. So that's the natural conclusion we come across, okay? Meaning this groups arises naturally when you start with any set X, okay? So let's see some examples, okay? So if examples, so in the beginning, I will be very elementary. Maybe later I will switch to this thing. So, okay, so let examples. So let's look at X to be singleton, consists of only one element, say, one itself, the number one. It is X is a set consists of only one element, namely number one. Then what is the bijections of X? Bx. So consists of only one element, namely one has to go to one. So this is identity of X. Okay. So this is Bx is what is called the trivial group. Okay. Is the trivial group, okay? That means it has only one element, that the group has only one element, namely the identity, okay? So it's, that is one example. So take two, x equal to two elements, say, for example, integers two and one and two, 
x. Then what is bx? So it has identity map of x first. And also there is a bijection, which I write like this, 1, 2. So what is 1, 2 does? 1, 2, when I act on 1, it will what it, it will take 1 to 2 and 1 2 when i act on 2 it because it's a bijection it has to take to 1 okay so this is the <coughs> bijection 1 going to 2 2 going to 1 its inverse is itself okay so bx so let's just write Bx is a group with two elements. Okay. <clears throat> and in fact, if you have attended Raghavan's lecture, you will see that Bx as a group is isomorphic to Z mod to Z. Okay, so in other words, so this I can think of as zero bar and one bar. That means if I if you use this Z mod to Z as cosets of integers of this group subgroup to Z. So there are two cosets, namely zero bar and one bar. And the operation is one bar plus one bar is zero bar, and zero bar plus one bar is one bar. So similarly, one bar plus zero bar is one bar. So the operation is like that. So similarly, in Bx, also one the bijection one two composite itself is the identity. So that means it's the inverse of this. Uh, 1, 2 is the inverse of itself, and it's the group of, there is only one group of order 2 up to isomorphism. So hence, I can identify this Bx with this Z mod 2x, which is also a group of order 2, which is an abelian group. Okay, So let's go to the example 3. Look at <coughs> x equal to 1, 2, Three. Okay. So now look at bijections. So what is Bx? I will write first the elements, the identity of x. So which will I will denote by E and one two, one three. I will write what are these uh, bijections. 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 1, 3, 2. So these bijections, the 1, 2 will, it will take 1, 2, 2, and 1, 2 of 2 is 1. It will take 1, one to 1 to 2, 2 to 1, and it will fix as 3. So that means what this function 1, 2, that I have written, that function fixes 3, this is equal to 3. Similarly, use this notation 1, 3 will take 1, 2 to 3, and 1, 2, 1, 3 of 2, because 2 is not there, it is fixes, is 2, 1, 3 of 3 is 1, that bijection, OK? So similarly, you can write down all others. So in the, I will just say it, what does it, 3, 2 will do? 3, 2 fixes 1 and takes 3 to 2, 2 to 3, OK? And 1, 2, 3 will 
permute all of them. The one one will be taken to two, two will be taken to three. And one, three, two will do, what does it do? It will take one to three, three to two, and two will be taken to one. Okay, so these are the bijections that one is considering. And you can check that these are all the bijections. There are no other bijections. So there are six elements are there. Okay. So already if you come to this, note that px is not commutative. Okay, so before that, I'll just uh, introduce this notation here. Moreover, if g1 dot g2 equal to g2 dot g1 for all g1 and g2 in g then we say that g is a commutative group or an abelian group in if i say abelian group i note this composition as g 1 plus g2 okay so that one uses that such kind of notation okay so so if the composition is commutative the law is comp commutative that means g1 g2 is same thing as g2 g1 so for all g1 g2 in g then you what you get is a commutative group but now you look at here already if i start with set of bijections if i take set of three elements and start looking at it's uh, the same yeah all the bijection of this set of three elements we'll see that this group that i am going to get is not commutative okay so let's look at example what does it do one you compose one two and then one three. So first you apply one three to an element and then apply one two to that element. What is this? So it will take one two where one goes to three, one three, and so I should write. So one goes to three and and when I apply one, it will take to three. Three will fix. Okay. So this is three. And then one, two, one, three, apply to two. Two is fixed, okay, the, from the first, this thing. And the second one will take to one, okay. And one, two, dot, one, three. So three will be taken to one under the first operation. And one will be taken to two. Okay. So that means this bijection is one, three, and three will be taken to two. Okay. So this, in other words, what we are getting is this is equal to product of. One, two, one, three. But if I look at the product of yeah. one, three, one, two, 
where will 1 goes to? 1 goes to 2 and 1, 3, 1, 2, supply on 2, 2 goes to 1, 1 goes to 3, 3 and 1, 3, 1, 2, apply on 3, 3 goes to 3 is fixed in the first element and the second element it takes 3 to 1. Okay. So in other words, it is 1, 2, 3. So that means 1, 2 into 1, 3, this product is not equal to 1, 3 into 1, 2. Okay. In the composition of the bijections, these two are different compositions, so that means this is not satisfying the commutativity law of the group. Okay, so this is not a commutative group. Okay, so this is what happened. Okay, so already you will notice that once you start with bijections, so the group is not going to be commutative if it contains at least three elements. Okay, so. Now, what I'm using here, see this, I'm looking at the bijection and I'm looking at given an element, where does it take to? So, okay, so that is what we are saying is the bijections is acting on the set X. So, okay, so that's what I want to introduce next. Okay. So, I have defined group and now I will define what is a group acting on a set X, okay? Let G be a group and X be a non-empty non-empty set. Definition G is said to act on X if there exists a map, this set map across x to x in the g comma x given these two elements an element in g and x in x i will get a image element which is i denote by gx okay gx so gx g times x meaning the image of this element g comma x i denote by gx so that means g the element of G, small g in capital G, acts on the element X in X to get another element in the set X, named that element I denote by G times X, okay? So, G is said to act on the group, G is said to act on a set X, non-empty set X, if there is a map like this satisfying One, two properties. One is, see, group has identity element. So look at its action. E times X equal to X for all X in X. E belongs to G is the identity element. So that means the identity element takes every element to itself, okay, under this action, okay. And second one is, second condition is 
इफ फॉर ऑल जी वन जी टू इन जी एंड एक्स इन एक्स फर्स्ट यू एक्ट ऑन जी टू ऑन द एलिमेंट एक्स एंड देन यू टेक द एक्शन ऑफ जी वन so this is same thing as now in the group you multiply g1 and g2 this is the group multiplication here group multiplication take that element that's an element in g act on x so this should satisfy this property so first you take element g2 in the group g and act upon x okay you get an another element in x so now on that if you act on g1 this is same thing as you multiply g1 and g2 this way g1 g2 in x in g and then you act upon x so you get that element this two has to be same so this is what is called the meaning if you have a group and a set x so then we say that the group acts on the set x to get such a meaning acts on such a set meaning a group is said to act on x if there is such a map from g cross x to x satisfying these two properties okay so note that the way we have defined bx okay is naturally so note that we mark bx x on x so is bx i said is a group under composition so what is this map bx cross x to x i have to define given a bijection f and a point x so i will map it to f the image of f under the image of x under the map f f is a bijection so i have this so notice that identity element of the group bx is the identity bijection which is identity of x namely x going to x so okay so idx comma x is nothing but idx of x which is equal to x okay so this first property is satisfied two if i have f1 f2 in g in px okay so now look at f of f2 of x applied on f1 of x is equal to f1 composed with f2 of x okay so that means the bx acts naturally on Eight. Okay. So, in other words, what we are saying is that, okay, what we want to claim is that action is the given a set gamma let G be a group. Acting. 
अने सेट एक्स देन द मैप G going to the function x g x x going to g x. This is element in b x. Okay. Is a group homomorphism. So first, let me just define. I have defined group. So recall, if G one and G two are two groups. then a homomorphism of homomorphism f from g1 to g2 is a map satisfy map from g1 to g2 satisfy it is taking identity element of g1 so i'll write e g1 to identity element of g2 e g2 and maps E G one dot G two. It takes this multiplication here is multiplication in G one. This also this multiplication take two elements and in G one and multiply them and look at its image. So this is same thing as G one f of G one f of G two. We have two elements. Take their multiplication. This is in G two. In G two, okay. a group homomorphism is a map F G one to G two, satisfying these two properties. One is it takes identity element to identity and preserves the multiplication from the first group to the second. Takes multiplication in the first group to the multiplication in the second group. That's what it means. Okay. So now, what we want to say is that a group acting on a set X immediately immediately gives a homomorphism from the group to set of bijections, which we saw is a group. Okay. So from G to B B X, we get a map. namely x going to gx for any element g in g so what we are claiming that this is a homomorphism okay so this yeah <clears throat> so that is the content of this lemma any questions okay so if there are no questions we'll go further this thing detail about this thing why is that is there this thing so first of all proof of the lemma so what is the map that let P G two 
Vivi. Nap. G1 by. The action of. G on X. So what does that mean? That is phi of G is the map, is the bijection, is by definition, is X going to G dot X, this bijection. That's what we are saying. First of all, see the action, this is X going to Gx is a bijection. First claim is that so phi g is a bijection. This is because it has an inverse, namely phi g inverse. So look at phi g inverse. So this is by definition what we will do. It will take x going to g inverse x. Okay. So now what what we are saying is that first act on this thing. So see x going to g x. I have this. So that means under the action of x, x will be taken to g x under the action of G, okay, and now GX will be taken to under G inverse. GX will be taken to G inverse of GX. Okay, but now use the property of the action. So this is same thing as G inverse G acting on X. But G inverse G is E, okay? E of dot X. But this is nothing but because the identity element of identity element of the group acts as an identity on the set, identity bijection on the set X. So that means it will take any E times X is X itself. Okay. So this will say that the inverse of phi g is is a bijection and b and its inverse is Pg inverse. Okay. In other words, under this thing, what it is happening is the for every g in g, Pg is a bijection, and the inverse of the bijection is this. So that means this is equal to because inverse of a function is nothing but this. Okay, so in other words, what we are saying is that, and also it's P of E, the identity element, P of E is identity of X, that's also clear. And it will take inverse to every element, PG is a projection, and P of identity is identity. And next, what we want to check is a homomorphism is P of G1 dot G2 is equal to P of G1 dot compose with P of G2. This is what we want to check. So this follows from from the second axiom of the action. That is what we have said is G1 dot 
G2 acting on X is same thing as G1 dot G2 X. Okay. So this way, <coughs> So whenever a group is, what we, what is the conclusion? What we get is the following. Whenever a group G acts on a set X, a non empty set X, then we naturally get get a homomorphism. G to set up bijections of yeah, the group of bijections. Okay, that is the group of bijection I, I denoted by Bx. Okay, so I get a group homomorphism. Okay, and conversely, conversely, if rho G two P X X is a set, non-empty set, and if you have a homomorphism, is a homomorphism. Then we get a get an action. of g on x so as follows so that means i have to define what is the map from g cross x to x okay so this is <coughs> given element g in g and x in x i want to define what is the image of the Meaning, what is this action? That's what I want to define. So, this action under this, how do I define this action? Once I given row, row of x, that's a row of g is a bijection. Because if I give an element g in g, I look at its image. So, that's a bijection, row of g. Row of g. But bijection acts on the set x. So namely, it takes any element to some other element, maybe it itself. So it takes elements of x to elements of x. So it is acting on x. Okay. So note that this belongs to, by definition, belongs to B of x, the bijections of x. And it's a homomorphism will imply that since Rho is a homomorphism implies the two properties that we needed for the this action e times so this I will denote this action. This is definition of this is g times x. Okay, so this satisfies this. The home of some implies e times x equal to x for all x in x and g1 g2 acting on x is same thing as g1 acting on g2 of x.
So because rho is a homomorphism, these two property will satisfy identity is taken to the identity automorphism of the Bx. So that identity automorphism rho of E is the identity bijection. So that's why you have the first property. So the second property follows from the fact that it's a homomorphism. Rho is a homomorphism. From that it follows that it has this property. So in other words, what we have conclude is that a group action on a set a group G acting on a set X <coughs> is equivalent to a homomorphism. G to Bx, the group of bijections of X. Okay. So this is a very, very useful notion to say that. So in other words, all the groups actually occur as subgroups of bijections. Okay. So So corollary, if G is a group, then G can be realized as a subgroup of PG itself, okay? Because G acts naturally on G, because G acts naturally on G because we are having a map G cross G to G, okay, namely G1, G2 going to the multiplication map. Okay. So here, what I'm thinking of here is G, one of the, the second copy of G I'm thinking of as the set, okay? And the first copy as the group. So the action is, the group has a multiplication. Under that multiplication, I have G1 times G2 makes sense. So that action is given. So the property of the group will say that this is G, this action. So, so this is okay. So G one X on G by left multiplication. So multiplication as an element of the group, okay? So take any element G2, you multiply on the left by G1, you get some element in this. Notice that this satisfies all the property that we 
are looking for, namely the action. If I take G1 to be identity, so identity times G2 is G2. So that means it satisfies the first property. And the second property is that follows from the fact that this multiplication is associative, right? So from that, it follows that. that G can be embedded. So this, take this action. For this action, I have this map. So hence, we get a, hence. So I'll denote by LG1, denoted by So then G1, G going to LG use a, a homomorphism L from G2 set of bijections of G. And what we are saying that this bijection is in this LG okay. LG the home of some G to P of G is injective. So let me recall. A home of some P from a group G1 to G2 of groups. is said to be injective injective if p of g equal to p e in g2 the identity element of g2 implies g equal to identity element of G1. Okay, so that means only element which maps to under this homomorphism maps to the identity element of G2 is the identity element of G1. Okay, so such a thing is called a injective homomorphism. So injective homomorphism, then once you have an injective homomorphism, then the image is a subgroup of G2. So let me recall also, because this is one notion, two, a subset H of G, G is a group, H is a, G is a group. is called a subgroup if E belongs to, E G belongs to H and H1, H2 in G, in H, implies H1 dot H2, that is the group operation in G, this is a group operation in G, under that group operation, G, so this element is in, again in 
H, okay? And H1 belongs to H, implies H1 inverse. So every element has an inverse, so that element is also in H, okay? If these three properties are satisfied, then such a H is called a subgroup, okay? Of a group of G. So what we have claiming is that G going to PG, the map given by the action of G on the left multiplication by elements of G is an injective group homomorphism. Okay. So in other words, this is usually called the Cayley's theorem. Okay. So this. Under this homomorphism, you can think of the, any group as a subgroup of bijections of a set. In, in fact, the set can be taken to be the group itself. Okay. okay. And in fact, so in other words, what we are saying is all the groups, okay, can be thought of as subgroups of, meaning all the groups arise out of an action of a group on a set. Okay, so that's what. So this as a corollary. This is called Cayley's theorem. What it says is every group is a subgroup of a set of the group of bijection of a set. The group of the group of bijections. of the set. Okay. So this is important thing is that the set of bijections form a group and every group can be realized as a subgroup of some bijections of a set X. Okay. So So the, and what it says is now bx comma x there is a natural action, namely f comma x going to f of x. Okay, so this can be used to study several properties of the group. Okay, so this is what I plan to do in the next two lectures. So I will stop here.